change. I think it wasn't updated, but it's the kind of human element of um, interacting with conversational AI. I've got some awesome uh, panelists here that are gonna talk from the experience, kind of nuances, uh, and I think what's interesting is um, the panel has a lot of experience in maybe non-commercial type products, things that actually are aimed at improving communities, youth, things like that. Um, yeah, I think we'll kick off with some introductions. Myself, I'm Rochelle. I'm the author of Grokking AI Algorithms. It's a book aimed at developers to kind of give them the intuition of AI algorithms, all from kind of classical to modern. Um, and I'm also the founder of Interacts, which is a remote collaboration tool um, that's recently got some um, generative AI integration uh, added to it. Uh, Avi, do you want to give us a quick overview of yourself? Hi everyone, uh, Avi Mudli. Um, I'm currently a principal AI specialist at CSIR. Been working on NLP, natural language processing, from the days when Naive Bayes was cool. Um, yeah, I've been at Vodacom for probably two years, preceding me coming back to CSIR, uh, working on the Toby chatbot there, building some cool stuff. So, looking forward to the conversation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mashudu Nefare. I'm from the University of Pretoria. By profession, I'm a clinical psychologist. And one of my key roles within the Department of Student Affairs, where I'm located, particularly at the Student um, Counseling Unit, uh, my primary role is to look at how can we look at digital platforms uh, to improve digital mental health literacies and provide additional support or offering for student well-being and overall optimal um, health and well-being. Yeah. Right, afternoon, everyone. My name is Brent Davidoff. I'm here on behalf of Harambi Youth Employment Accelerator, um, and I think there's just a great joy in being in community, and that so it's worth just celebrating that already before we even start talking. Um, so I work within the network experience, essentially the contact centre, um, and work with them trying to expand and innovate our channels to connect with our network of 3.8 million young people across the country, young people. Awesome, thanks everyone. So, yeah, as you can tell, um, a lot of, I think Mashudu and Brent bring a lot of kind of on the ground and kind of psychology expertise to this discussion. I guess Avi and I are more on the technical uh, side of things, but I think this discussion is gonna be not too technical, a bit high level, uh, but we are looking at kind of access how do you promote access? How do you promote distribution? How do you take you know, international succeeding technologies and localize it for real human problems here in our country? So I think to kick it off, maybe if uh, I could pose a question to everyone, what kind of local problems uh, are you attacking with, with AI or conversational AI? We spoke a little bit about it before, but I think it'd be quite interesting to, to the audience to learn some of that. Have we start with Brent? Sure, so um, I think that primarily it's solving youth unemployment. That's a big one, and systemic issue. It's complex, but I think that we've, uh, there's certain people are on their own journeys, young people on their own journeys. Some of them going towards making their own money, some um, are uh, studying, others are looking to get into the job market. Um, but the, and that, I mean, that's a crisis, youth unemployment. I think um, there are millions of young people, though, who are neats, not in employment or training, education, and they're on the edge of losing hope. So that's probably one of the biggest problems, is once someone is unemployed for a long time um, and not busy, then they begin to lose self-belief, confidence in the system, in themselves. Um, so I think the deeper problem is giving people a sense of importance as well as hope, um, backed up by practical things, not just hope is a currency that can be used incorrectly. Um, so to use, to build hope and then to present different pathways to try and help people go uh, to, to earning and learning opportunities that can make them independent. Awesome, and, and how, how have you started doing that with conversational 
products? So uh, the, the power of conversation is true no matter what. So I think um, before we even talk about chatbots, it's conversational interfaces and experiences. So throughout our organization, we've got internal employee experience, conversational interfaces. So even for, we call them guides, um, not contact center agents. Guide on the side, not sage on the stage, because they're just there kind of to try and show a bit of a way forward. Um, so they have a conversational experience as well. So in their actual kind of data collection, it's conversational for them. But then, of course, with chatbots, we've got a customer service chatbot, which is an FAQ chatbot, which is just really supposed to answer questions really well, which is hard to do. And then, um, and, and really to provide that, because unemployment doesn't take weekends. Uh, so we need to make sure that that support is available there all the time. Uh, we're on Facebook, about to go into WhatsApp with that as well. But then we've got another WhatsApp um, conversational agent called Coach Me, which is a virtual coach, and that operates off, um, off WhatsApp. And that really is just helping people in a non-prescriptive way towards their goals, to, to its well-being and productivity. So we found that you don't have to tell people much, that in a day there's enough experiences to, to tell you what you need to do. You just need to have someone to help you reflect on it and to maybe give you a bit of guidance in the way forward. So what this um, AR chatbot Coach Me does is it both gives people motivation, mindfulness, as well as uh, work-seeking tips, productivity, and then connects them, doesn't so try to solve all problems themselves, connects them to emotional support, well-being, um, different places when it knows. The best thing it can do is encourage uh, help-seeking behavior. Um, yeah, and then even just the RVRs, interactive voice, is it recordings or, or ro what's it? Inter uh, RVRs, interactive voice? Response. Response, yes. Welcome to MTS. So, um, <laughs> um, that, that is also a conversational interface, and it's like, how tone deaf can your RVR actually be? Um, to, so, that's also, we look at that as well. Yeah. Awesome, thanks, Brent. Uh, Mashuda, I know you're also involved in something quite similar with the University of Pretoria. I guess similar problems, maybe different angles on it. Uh, do you want to maybe share with us what those are? I think uh, in terms of similarity from what my colleague was just sharing is the issue of mental health. Um, I think uh, the global pandemic of COVID also highlighted significantly the impact of where students are at, where it affects their mind and where it also affects their bodies and how this translates to different domains of their lives, be it academics, be it a, a, or the overall health, be it you know, um, other issues such as relationships. And um, we've, we provide services looking again, what is the immediate need? It may not be that all students will experience or be diagnosed with a mental health disorder, but how are we matching the specific needs of the student? Be it you know, through our digital uh, platforms, our podcast series that we provide. Um, also, we piloted uh, from February till August um, a mental health chat pod that provided, again, uh, resources and support tools, which is a inter, I'll say, a primary intervention tool um, to look at how do we reach out to those that may not reach out immediately? How do we increase awareness and education around mental health, especially on the prominent disorders of the common challenges that students come across or may be diagnosed with, such as your depression, your anxiety, and also referring them to the immediate, uh, immediate support care. So all the digital platforms that we also provide links them to also this um, emergency support care, uh, which will link them to an immediate, uh, not face-to-face -face person, but a voice um, in human factor. So those are, uh, are the common problems that we're also seeing, but this are, as I was indicating earlier on, it's some of the tools or resources that are available for the students to be able to access. Um, but also the important thing, I think, when it comes to mental health is to ensure that we continue to expand the access and reach, um, especially during times where students may not be able to visit a student counseling unit during the working hours. Maybe it's a weekend, maybe it's Christmas Day. How do they still ensure or how do we still continue to ensure continued care and support during periods that may have a uh, degree of anxiety, degree of stress, 
Um, often we may assume that periods of Christmas and New Year is a joyous period. Um, what we also noticed when we developed um, a bot during the COVID-19 pandemic, when students had to um, study remotely, we noticed that on Christmas and New Year, uh, students were still logging onto the bot um, and f asking information about depression, asking information about anxiety, which highlights the need to also diversify the, 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 the service offerings to again match the needs irrespective of where one is by location, irrespective of where one is in terms of you know, the accessibility to, to resources and tools that they may need to promote their overall well-being that directly also snowballs into many other domains of their lives. Awesome. I've got some hairy questions around that because I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that area is quite Sorry. difficult to, to deal with, than, uh, but that might be unpredictable. Uh, but Avi, I want to hear from you. What kind of problems have you been tackling with, with AI and conversational chat? Cool. Um, yeah, so conversational AI-wise, I would say um, during the course of the pandemic, um, I did a small little adventure at Vodacom where there's a lot of people here from that team right now. But um, yeah, we went on a NLU-based chatbot journey. Um, spending pretty much the course of 18 months uh, changing how that Toby chatbot and Vodacom worked, um, going from misunderstanding 45% of our customers down to about 15% at the time, and just incorporating a whole lot of data-driven practices and kind of building a chatbot that actually cared about its customers. Um, so that was quite a fun journey, and then Recently, I've been gone, well, I've gone back to more of the fundamental stuff. Um, back at CSIR, doing some research into large models, um, using natural language processing for discovering knowledge from unsupervised data, um, trying to do some of the dirty work that sits um, on the sides of the generative AI space that um, will be beneficial in a couple of years' time as it matures. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so I think you know we've heard a lot about bots that maybe have application in you know commercial products or customer support and things like that. My opinion, I think there's less risk there. There's le less to lose if you come back with a bad response. You know, if you you ask for a balance and the balance it, it, under, it wants it's to give you your I don't know contract details. Okay, but what happens if someone asks a mental health question or they're in a desperate situation for a job um, and the bot reacts in a way that we can't predict or, you know, I don't know if anyone's played with ChatGPT versus Bing, uh, Bard, all the ones that are out right now, but they all behave a little bit differently. They almost have their own kind of personalities apart from the emotion and, and the words they say. For example, with Bing, it can be quite rude. Like, if it doesn't want to talk to you anymore, it says, I'm not comfortable talking to you anymore. I'm ending this conversation. Now, I'm imagining someone that's in a mental health situation and a bot says something like that to them. You might even, you know, create a bigger problem, um, you know, by using technology. So do you have any maybe learnings, any problems you've overcome in that area that, that we can learn from? I think uh, in the developmental phases, as indicated earlier on, when we're looking at how do we want to journey uh, with the clients we may spe specifically be targeting, in the, in, in the um, case of, let's say, particularly students, I think it is also very important to always have oversight, um, you know, by both the technical um, experts, but also by the professional ex experts and also to enable the bot to be able to recognize when it cannot be able to respond and you know, give an empathetic response. To say, I'm sorry, I'm not able to assist, however, I can link you to a you know, care support or care line that can further you know, assist. And also, again, in understanding the language. Mental health, I always say, is very complex because there's not always one word that can reflect everything. And in our multiple or diverse, you know, contexts in Africa, we have so many words to describe so many things. So it's always important whilst, you know, we develop this generative AI that we take that into context um, and also be able to recognize when a word may not be used for its appropriate use, but also to recognize that sometimes as a result of the way or the state, state of mind in which an individual can be, this can also affect language. They will write inappropriate text 
um, especially if someone has um, bipolar or is having a bipolar episode, a manic episode, they will text a lot of family members. They will send very inappropriate texts. Um, and, and again, to be able to recognize these patterns that they're very inconsistent, which is also not just about you know, trying to trigger the, 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 the pot, but also trying to reflect that there's a need, there's a crisis, where the monitoring, which is quite regular, would be very vital to ensure that such um, individuals are not you know, left out and are also identified quite early in terms of crisis management to refer them again to the appropriate care and also probably integrating the human factor um, that, as I indicated, that sometimes because of the, co uh, the cost or the condition that the person presents with, they may not make sense. So to be able to have someone live to be able to also assess them immediately, I think that is, would be also important. But also take into cognizance the language um, aspects, um, not even in terms of translation, but meanings and the context we attach to what does depression, for example, in Venda mean? What is the word for depression? What is it maybe in, um, in Afrikaans or in, 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 in Kosa? Uh, you may find that there isn't just a direct word, but to also understand how do we also contextualize our, our, our local language for words that we refer to or might uh, associate with mental health related topics. I don't know what you thought. Yeah, think. so I think that first of all, you, this is why a multidisciplinary approach is so important because you could have design teams and content writing teams trying to think about this, but you, you need to speak to Mashudu to think about these things because you've, when you're dealing with human beings, you have to understand that people are not going to only talk to you about the things that you want them to talk to you about. So, for example, like, you know, it might be I love you, but if they have someone to talk to, they're going to put it all out there. So there's, there's ideas that when we spoke initially, this idea of containment, and that's something we teach our guides. You can't, someone calls in, um, and they're experiencing emotional distress. How does a guide deal with that? How do they contain, validate, acknowledge, but then don't try and deal with it by themselves? The same training would need to be provided in a different way to a chatbot. Now, when we get to generative AI, so there needs to be one, a fail safe. And what we have is on all our platforms, we have a trigger that at any moment, if there are certain words mentioned, anything suicide, suicidal, even certain emojis, triggers a, mess, a template WhatsApp message or a template Facebook message with a, a, a call to action button to South African Depression Anxiety Group, Lifeline, um, or a chatbot like that. Now, with generative AI, you don't want to just have that. So this is why I was asking Kurbis earlier about, we want to, there's one moment where our chatbot asks, how are you doing? Now that is, that is a, it's a monumental amount of planning and prompting and training to be able to deal with someone's feelings of how they're doing and all the different things that can come there. So on the one hand, you want to have a diverse approach, which if someone just says that, like, you know, this is the day I had, da, 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 multiple things, you give a nice response, beautiful response. But when it comes to training your AI to be able to know when it can't handle something and say, it sounds like you are in emotional distress. Here's what I have to say. But I also would like to give you numbers and that to, to say like that. Now, when you train it too much, every single time it says, it sounds like you're in emotional distress. I think you should reach out for professional support. That just happens every single time then. So that balancing is very important. But I feel kind of safe knowing that we've got that fail-safe measure there at the same time. I mean, we had, I get even a little ping on my phone every time certain keywords are mentioned. The other day I went in. And that ping actually came up because someone said their phone is broken. Broken is actually a keyword we have. But I just saw before one I didn't pick up. So I'm 16 and I want to commit suicide. And I was like, I just, I, I don't know what to think. I, I was, I was um, in a way, glad to know that that person immediately got resources to reach out to. I thought, should we shut down this bot because I can't deal with that? Or should we just know that as much as possible we have to make something available there for this person? What we want to be able to do is have someone like Mashudu that is part of the QA team that says, like, let's reach out to this person as well, that only comes through our partnerships and multidisciplinary approach.
Oh, so when you talk about monitoring, um, is it real-time live monitoring by humans? So, f for example, Mishri, you were talking about, you know, I don't know, getting alerts in real time. Like, if something potentially dangerous happens, is, that, is there a human available to reach out? Because what it sounds like, I think often when we, when we look at AI and the kind of jobs, we think it's taking away jobs. We'll maybe touch on that a bit. But I think scaling and providing at least a standard level of service to people who might not have had that service before um, is what it's trying to solve, right? So someone who wouldn't have any access to any resources can have a basic level of access unless it becomes harmful. But how does that monitoring work? And also, Avi, from your side, are there any kind of technical uh, angles from the training, training side, the modeling side that you might recommend uh, to kind of help tackle these complex issues? But he asked two questions here. Let's solve the monitoring. All right. I think the monitoring is, should, should be a daily one. Um, because um, when, we, uh, when we look at mental health, it does not have a time, place, demographic, gender, space. It happens you know, re continuously and unexpectedly and for a variety of reasons. So it's always important to ensure that if we're seeing certain patterns that you know, the AI is not able to respond to, is not able to give support, um, as I indicated um, that on the, on the chat pod that we were piloting, it immediately linked them to the UP Care Line. The UP Care Line is the emergency mental health support where a registered counselor will be able to immediately pick up the call as soon as they call and it does not require data, nor does it require airtime to be able to link or connect to the, to, the, to the service provider or the registered counselor. But also again, there are ethics around that. Um, you know, as an institution of higher learning, sometimes we may have students that enter the university before the ages of consent, uh, where, you know, parents need to give consent. So that is also another important aspect to also look at, you know, how, how is this consent going to be obtained, especially where there might be a parental or guardian, you know, um, request or need for them to consent especially using any form of uh, mental health intervention or assessment tool, including your AI um, generative uh, or conversational agents. Okay. Yeah, so on the, on the technical side, I would say probably context matters the most. So when we did speak about this um, on our calls, prepping for this, um, some of the things that uh, we were talking about was what do you do in these exceptional circumstances is about um, the most appropriate thing. And I'm probably one of the biggest AI advocates, but when it comes down to stuff like mental health, I'm actually scared to put AI at that point. Um, it's needed and it does great work, um, but the, um, the guardrails, like not everybody is as thoughtful and thinking about those things as you guys are with the applications that you're building. The concern, especially with generative AI, um, I would say like on an NLU-based system, you would end up getting a misunderstanding. That's the worst that would happen where you tell the person that, I don't understand what you're saying. But I think for even like the audience who's venturing into using generative AI in some of their commercial applications, make sure that it is deterministic, or at least as deterministic as possible. You don't want your bot to say something to the wrong person that puts your brand into disrepute. So I would actually advise to use a small model that you can actually customize and have control over, rather than chasing GPT-4, GPT-5 when that happens. Um, I think. Context matters, and especially in um, our in our country, um, with the diverse people that we have here, the number of languages, it's very very easy to offend people, um, and that's just something that we always need to keep in mind whenever we're doing anything NLP and generative AI. I would say that. Um, the way you learn about where those guardrails need to be is you have to be actually engage in the conversation. Because if you don't engage in the conversation, you're not going to be able to learn from them. You're not going to have the data to learn from them. So, um, and also including people in the decision. Because I, I really, I think about that so often about should we have an AI, should just disconnect and have a standard response? 
or should it actually try and engage but with the guardrails? I think, well, don't mind what I think. What would this young person think, actually? Do they say, no, don't give this to me because there's a risk that it may not be right? Do they say, no, give me what you have. Give me what you have, and I hope that someone is checking it out. So, yes, you've got to have human beings and other generative AI models tagging and checking and QAing. You have just-in-time emergency responses. But I do think that there's some risk-taking that if you have tight feedback loops in, pr in place, then you will teach it to be more responsible because sometimes people actually say, no, I actually do want you to give me a motivational quote or something like that. But to know that, I mean, I've seen it before. When someone just, there's a difference between mental well-being and mental illness, mental health. So if someone says that they're going through depression, you can't say focus on the good things in life. You can't do that. And I saw that happen. And I, again, but we took immediate action on that, reached out to the person that happened to. There's also a thing of consent there. But um, so there is certainly no clear answer to that. And you can hold both these worlds at the same time. Um, if we can just also comment on what you're sharing is that it is also very important when developing AI or generative AI um, chatbots for mental health that you use also evidence-based tools um, that are also uh, have been, you know, um, tested. Uh, and also, again, that have been trialed to, sh to show efficacy, so that they have, they have been active um, in terms of you know, the resources and tools that you provide. But also, again, if there is no integration in the part that you're also providing, that you do not provide other tools or techniques that you know, can be triggering. Um, that may mean need a containing environment. So it's again in, uh, taking into account what are some of the, 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 the realities of the tools that we can be able to, to incorporate and what are some of the, 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 the techniques we may not be able to integrate if there's not a human factor that will be able to contain the environment. But also related to that is what is, what is the ethical guidelines guiding in terms of how to engage with human behavior relating to their mental well-being. Um, and how do we, um, the, the HPCSA is very steady on psychology on how do we ensure that we do no harm. And if we're looking at the population of South Africa and the ratio of psychiatrists and psychologists versus the population and the needs for mental health, it's very wide. And again, providing platforms such as, such as you know, AI or generative AI Pods provides access, provides opportunity, but I think it is also important to also consider the risk and how how is those risk factors going to be mitigated? And again, that brought, brings back to the topic of the integration of stakeholders at different phases, um, you know, of of the development and even post you know, the maintenance, the continued development. If there's a new technology, if there's a new maybe um, technique in psychology that is, has, has changed or advanced the way in which people can promote their well-being and become better, that there's always rigorous, you know, um, assessment of data, assessment of literature as well in terms of what are some of the best practices um, for our context and also in a global perspective that can be integrated but also taking into cognizance that there will be certain challenges that we need to be addressing, um, especially around the ethics. What are the what is the uh, uh, the HPCSA requiring? You know the language issues, the cultural issues, um, the issues of privacy, the consent, um, but also the opportunities to also detect early, uh, because through um, you know chatbots you can also in, in, in able to incorporate your screening tools which can, will enable us to also screen quite early and detect early. And we know the benefits of early intervention versus the later intervention. Not saying that the, the later intervention will still not yield outcomes, but we know that the sooner we, we intervene, the better the outcomes, especially around mental well-being. And also reducing the stigma uh, that mental health also can, can be associated with by you know, the anonymous nature in which the chatbot can also be generated in terms of supporting uh, one's well-being or individual well-being. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I, th I think I've, I've seen like two themes. I think the one is more of a meta kind of the populist understanding of these chatbots. Do they understand it's not a person? You know, I, I heard some other talks where there is an emphasis to make sure that the end user understands this is a computer speaking to you. It's trying to communicate with you fluently. It's trying to help you, but please do not take this seriously. So that 
you know, I think if generally people understand that, which I don't know how you'd measure, I guess you have to to make sure that you kind of kind of target market or or group that you you're focusing your product on does have a clear understanding that this is a computer, then you probably could minimize harm that way instead of you know more sophisticated or costly endeavors like having humans available for every chat in real time. Um, and I think the other one, it sounds like what you guys are saying is if you haven't had those conversations with the people as a human, you shouldn't try and make a bot to do it. Because like Brent, you were saying, um, you know, all the learnings from your guides that actually interacted with the, stu uh, the students or youth, um, that's what fine-tuned this project for the, for the chatbot. So if you haven't done it yourself, you probably shouldn't just grab something off the shelf and try and make it happen. We, we look at it as, as AI scaling human beings. So our guides are, you're just not going to get better than you hear them on the phone. You should know that if a, if a, if a young person calls 0800-7272-72, they will get through to one of the most world-class call centers with a world-class um, agent. So you're not going to replace them. They need to be taken to scale. So AI can help, the, help that happen. Yeah. Cool, awesome. I think that's it from time perspective, but I think we could take some questions perhaps. Yeah, sure. This is such a fascinating topic. Again, this whole call it AI for good, using technology for good. There's a question on the chat, which I think is interesting, and then we'll get to you. And then we're going to have a coffee break before we come back. <clears throat> um, the question is, can we use generative AI um, with autism? And I think I maybe want to just make it a bit broader than generative AI. How can we use technology? And just on a personal note, why that's relevant, because I've got Asperger's, so I'm on the autism uh, spectrum. A lot of people over the last few years that I've been working with, who especially for some reason work in the field of AI, are also on the spectrum. I don't know if you know this, but from Turing through to Bill Gates, um, through to Elon Musk, um, Steve Jobs, all people on the spectrum. So, and maybe we should start with the psychologist here, is how can we use technology to treat it? I think let's keep the answer fairly short. We'll take that answer, a question, and then we'll have a, a break. Sorry, it's a massive question for three minutes. No problem. <laughs> um, so I think uh, I, I would not class it only just for one uh, condition or disorder, uh, but what the generative AI can help is, you know, stimulating skills that can promote well-being, um, and also working on maybe sometimes the cognitive thoughts that may also impact on one's ability to perform optimally because of maybe the negative thoughts and maybe the difficulty, especially with, you know, the autism um, spectrum, that you, one may struggle with, you know, social interaction, social engagement, and it's more about upskilling the skills that they may uh, find it quite difficult, especially that, especially in the context of, you know, um, large engagements or large communication. So I think AI has, has room to improve skills um, of coping, skills of you know improving personal development, it will not. I think. Okay, let me re-say this. I, I feel that it will be able to provide the skills to cope, skills to be able to improve one's well-being. It may not address every aspect of what's affecting your condition, uh, and some condition may need uh, the integration of medical treatment, medicine. And so in that instance, they, they could be monitoring that can help assist to track how compliant are you with your treatment, are there you know, rib lapses issues, are there non-compliance issues, but it may not address every aspect of the condition or disorder, any type of disorder, but it will help uh, you know, by providing bettering uh, aspects that can affect general mental health disorders in, in summary. Can I just, uh, maybe a quick one from me is, uh, oncologist at all, but I've been building software for over a decade for kind of all different corporates and enterprises, and I think the key thing there, principle, is this kind of multimodal approach. So perhaps chat is not the answer for that market that you're targeting. Maybe you, you need to have something more structured. Maybe you need to have an app or a, a structured directory or you know something different that targets types of people. Um, also, in learning, people learn differently. 
and there's this myth, okay, people learn better if it's visual. No, some people learn better if it's visual. Some learn better if it's audiovisual. Some people need books. You know, so I think that principle of, I think that key takeaway is understanding exactly who you're serving, deeply empathizing and understanding that context, domain, and situation, and then crafting whatever. It can be AI or not AI related, but I think that's the crux of it if, if I was to, to try and tackle that. Right. Um, if, you're un if we're ever unsure about how to deal with the problem or with the human being, which is the answer, listen and listen deeply. Before even coming up with answers, listen and listen deeply. And generally, good stuff comes out of that. That's what we found. So the moment, there are so many assumptions that need to be broken every day within my own decision making. And then if we just l switch to listening mode to anyone who might we feel not included in current systems, you're going to further exclude them if you don't bring them into the thinking about how to address and to include them. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this very important topic of, of mental health. Um, and I think this is a very important um, task that you're doing, Mashudu with regards to access to a broader population with regards to mental health um, information. My question is this, or just share your views around uh, the intersection of language and mental health um, information, because, for example, in African languages, there's not a lot of vocabulary that explains certain mental health uh, conditions. So how do you, what is your views around um, language in, in mental health? about information. Thank you. I think language is a very powerful tool for everyone. And I think we can use that in varied platforms and tools to create. Um, because um, sometimes we may find that some of the conditions or words we use, uh, we understand what it could mean. Like, for example, the common word that people would use um, in, you know, in communities when they are feeling depressed is stressed. So it's also, you know, emphasizing that when you stress, this is an indication of that things may not be where they are at this point in time, or maybe you are being affected by things that have affected your mood, your sleep, your appetite, you know, your general motivation and drive towards life. And I think that is where language becomes a powerful tool of education. And using, obviously, local context, um, you know, to say that what is the general word we you would associate with, you know, a classical, uh, common mental disorder such as, you know, depression or anxiety. Um, what, what is the common word we can also use that we also often find that we associate with and starting to maybe use gamification maybe in applications to improve language around mental health. Um, you know, maybe wet scrabbles, you know, a bingo game. Again, that's, again, using language to be able to, to impact, uh, you know, in terms of just understanding that, okay, there is schizophrenia. That there is bipolar, they are different. Um, you know, even though we may not know the different distinct, uh, distinctions, but we're starting to be aware that there's different names for mental health disorders. There's not just one broad umbrella that you have a mental condition. Which one? How does it affect your functioning? And to what degree? What is the severity? Is there need for, mental, uh, for intervention in terms of social assessment, psychiatry, you know, intervention? So I think language is very important and a very powerful tool that we can be able to educate, um, especially in an area that has been um, stigmatized a lot. So I think it is important, even in the development, to be aware of how language can also be a, a, an ed educational tool. Um, there's, when Mashudu May, I'm just going to be sending everyone there. Um, that's, I want young people to be in her hands, you know, the chatbot she creates. The, the, to add to your question is on the mental wellness side, what are our words for mindfulness, meditation, zimamele, I don't know, we've come up with different, but at the same time we said while we're figuring it out, let's still introduce mindfulness and meditation. And the most beautiful, mindfulness has, they said, how's it helped you? And they said, it helps me to know what's in my mind. So either you could say that's broken English, or you could say that's the most eloquent expression of what mindfulness is supposed to do. Um, so the, it's like also that level of those evidence-based practices, gratitude journaling, mindfulness, how can we also localize that as well through language? 
And also using maybe indigenous games, uh, if I can just add on. Um, we know um, there's, I'm just forgetting, in Venda you call it Nord, Nord, Norde. Um, it's just, you, you play, um, you know, we up and then you have, you know, little ones coming out of the circle drawn on the outside. What that also can teach is that, you know, teamwork, um, you know, it can teach one about taking turns. It can teach one very basic other skills, but still making it fun, still making it relevant because it is, it's a, it's, a, it's an activity that we do as, you know, as South Africans, um, especially in, you know, rural context. It's a very fun way to connect, fun way to also engage with others, but still building on those, you know, social skills that we still may even require to learn them, even if it's through, if it's through a generated type um, portal platform. Wow, what a relevant topic again to the panel. Thank you so much. Um, I, think, I think more people are struggling with mental health post the pandemic, or maybe more of us have had it and then we only realized it now, but it's a hugely relevant topic. And if we can use technology alongside humans to, to help people, it is great. Thank you to all of you. Please give them a warm uh, round of applause. Thank you, guys. I'll just leave your mics on the chairs, that's fine. We're going to have a 20-minute coffee break. And again, with or without you, we're going to start in 20 minutes. So we've got three exciting talks before the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you.